Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Price, and I am a professional worrier. You're supposed to say, hello, Adam. It's recovery talk. My wife is actually flying back as we speak. I worry about her flying back in safety. I forgot my mask. I would have worn my mask in honor of her because I worry about her getting the coronavirus. I have been a worrier. If there was such a thing as the, the gift of worry, I would probably have that. I have a tendency to worry. It's been happening my whole life. I started, you know, as a young child, I would worry about my grades at school. I worried about the tests. I worried about passing. I worried about all these different things, like, am I going to let my parents down? I worried about, you know, if I was going to make friends at school. And I remember very vividly just praying to God, God, I just cannot wait until I'm an adult and I don't have to worry anymore. Man, when I become an adult, I won't have to have anything to worry about ever again because this being a kid stuff is tough. And as I got older, I started worrying even more. Where am I going to go to college? What am I going to do? Am I going to make a mistake? How much money am I going to make? Am I going to ever find somebody that I'm going to actually like to marry and they're going to like to marry me? And then I did. And then after that, I was worried about, are we going to be able to have children? And we did. And we had this beautiful little boy. And I thought, wow, I have everything I ever wanted. I am totally content. I will never have to worry again. That lasted about 10 seconds. Because then I, I saw this little boy, this little bundle, of probably eight pounds, just full of worry. And I thought, oh man, for the next 18 years, years. I'm going to have to worry about everything with this guy. And he grew up and he left. Worry stayed. What is up with worry? It just keeps going and going and going. Here's the thing about worry. Worry is number one. Worry is not my friend. Worry is not my friend. Look, it always tries to get me to live in a couple different places I don't want to live. Either my past or my future. It's not my friend. Worry always tends to make me want to forget just living in the moment where I'm filled with thankfulness and where I'm filled with gratitude. Secondly, worry is ravenous. It takes no prisoners. I can worry about not having kids. At the same time, I can worry about having kids. It doesn't matter. Whatever situation I'm in, I can worry about it. It's just one of those things where I'm just always, no matter what the outcome, I will worry. It's ravenous. I have this unlimited capacity to worry. Thirdly, worry is relentlessly killing my joy. It relentlessly kills my joy. I'm always telling myself, I'm not enough. Wait, is that enough? Wait, what are people thinking about me? Oh, they're not going to like it. Wait, oh, my bubble's about to burst. I don't know. I'm going to make a lot of people feel bad. Worry, worry, worry. Worry will get me to say, but what if? What if I had only... Instead of saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Worry will make me say things like, if only I would have. Instead of, in all things, give thanks. Fourthly, worry is sneaky. Worry, worry happens in my life and I don't even know it. Just this last week, I'm like, I'm walking around the house. My, my brow is just furrowed and I'm just walking around. And Jen's like, what's going on? 
ah, I'm worried about the stupid sermon I've got to write for Sunday. Well, what are you preaching on? I'm preaching on what Jesus is talking about, about not worrying. She's like, wait, wait, let me get this straight. You're actually trying to, you're worried about how to teach people to never worry. And I'm like, yeah, what's your point? <laughs> Jesus hates worry. He hates what worry does to us. He hates how, how it makes us small, how it makes us selfish, how it makes us prideful, how it makes us timid, how worry kind of makes us mean. He hates how it chokes our joy. He hates how it steals our dreams. He hates how, he hates how it, it just kind of destroys the hours of our day because it just is constantly on our brain and on our minds, this worry. Can I let you know something, though? As much as Jesus hates worry, he loves the worriers. He adores worriers. He has such a capacity and such a compassion for people who worry. My friend, it may be that worry and anxiety, even like panic attacks, are things that are just crushing you in your life. There may be people in your life right now who don't even help you with that. There are even churches in this world that will make you feel bad for worrying, telling you that you're not doing enough. You know what? You don't have enough faith. You must be doing, that just crushes people. Can I just say, never say that to somebody? It crushes people. So here we are today on the Sermon on the Mount with the words of Jesus. And these are words that come really close to his ministry because they really affect his life. And we're starting in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus' words. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? That should be on every bathroom mirror in every house in this country. Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's a lot in this, okay? There's a Christian author who actually talks about this in his writings, how to locate our lives in the reality of living in the kingdom of God, like Jesus is describing, and how we can live a life beyond worry by living it one day at a time. He says we live at this intersection. We live at an intersection in the past and the future. All of us have a past and we actually remember what is behind us in one of two ways. We remember with regret or we remember with gratitude. We all have a future. We aspire for a future. We anticipate our future and we do it in one of two ways, either with hope or with fear. The only place where we can find God is in the moment right now. See, regret is, is what we, we tend to do with our past. And whenever we fill our lives with regret from our past, we're always filled with worry. Fear and anxiety will try to make us live in the future. 
And we're not called to live in the future. God calls us to live in this moment. In the here and now. And this is His gift to us. This moment. See, we're creatures that are actually confined to time. We live on this timeline where we have a past. We have a future. We're also creatures that are kind of confined with space. We occupy space. So there's another dimension to this chart. Again, our outer world is the world in which God has given us. It's it's the world that he has created, this this planet. All of the nature that we we get to enjoy, it's a gift from God. And then there's this inner world, the inner mind. It's what God has given us in our thoughts. Did you know that we have this unending flow of thoughts and feelings going on in our mind at an incredible rate all the time? And it's a gift from God that he has given us. The whole world is a gift from God. We're made by God to dwell in our inner mind with peace. The Bible says this, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then we're made to engage in our outer world with love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. So the red X that you see on on the chart, this is where you and I live. We live at an intersection from our past and our future, from our mind and from our world. And you live in the center of this cross. You live in the center of a cross. We live a life in the shape of a cross. We're not called to live in our past. We're not called to live in our future. We're called to live in the present moment right now here. We come across a number of here and now moments, and let's just be honest, we take them for granted. We take for granted our moments that we live each and every moment. Every now is a miracle. Every now is a gift. It's probably why it's called the present, because it's a gift from God. Now is part of eternity. You are the one creature on this planet that God has placed eternity in your heart. No other creature on the planet has it but you. You live a cross-shaped life. And that's why the most important word in this passage is the first word, the word therefore. Therefore, do not worry. Now, don't worry not because worry is horrible, although it is. Don't worry because it's hurting for your health because it truly does hurt your health. Don't worry because we live in a God-made, God-shaped, God-loved world. And we're safe in the hands of God. I like to tell my friends and family, we live in the palm of his hand. You and I, we live in the safety of the palm of God's hand. Many of you know that Jen and I have golden retrievers. Um, Our male is Gunther. He's quite cute and good looking. So we feed him and he loves that we feed him. He is so grateful If I could speak Gunther language, he would be like, you know what? I can't believe you're still here. You love me. You feed me all the time. I love you so much. That's Gunther. In the same way, Jesus says, this is what God's creation does with God. The birds of the air and the flowers of the field They're just like, they worship God in a way. It's just like, I thank you so much for loving me. I thank you so much for taking care of me. I thank you so much for being here. I love you. We don't live in a machine. Even science can't say we live in a machine. You know, every time that a hummingbird comes down and swoops into a flower and takes that nectar... Every time that a flower shoots up out of the ground, that's God. That's God. And he hasn't even gotten to you yet. In the book of Luke, chapter 12, Jesus says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? 
Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, some of you, that's easier than others. But he says, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I want you to take a person, uh, take a look at the person next to you and just think, how many sparrows is this person worth? If you could trade them in for an amount of sparrows, how many sparrows would that be? At least 10. Four pennies. In all honesty, you might be thinking right now, you know what, Adam, I don't see a lot of evidence that God cares for me. I just don't see it. I'm not living the life I want to live. I'm not making the money I want to make. I don't have the house I want. I don't have the things that I want. I don't have the relationships I even want for Pete's sake. I, I, I rarely have a good day. Let me ask you, what does it take for you to have a really good day? What does it take for you to have a really good day? Because this is the day the Lord has made. And he says, let us rejoice and be glad in this moment, right now. Not the past, not the future, in this moment. Let me tell you a story about Jack. Jack had cancer. Jack, Jack's body was riddled with cancer. And he went through some extensive chemotherapy and he made it through. It was very painful. He made it through to the very, the very end. He's very thankful for that. A month later, he, he went in for his first checkup. And the lab results showed that the cancer was back as bad as it ever was before he ever even took the chemo. And he was really discouraged. I tell you what, he was a doctor and that was his worst day because that was the day he knew he was going to die. The next day, the hospital calls, and they said, you know what? The lab technician mistakenly switched your chart with somebody else's chart. Now, the chart that we gave you, the results were, you know, this guy hadn't even started his chemo. He had, he has, he's got to go through this whole chemo stuff. He's riddled with cancer. You are cancer free. And because he was a doctor, the hospital was like, do you, do you want us to get the technician on the line so you can yell at him? <laughs> and he's like, yell at them? I want to hug him. I, I want to I, I kiss him. Because that day, the day after that Jack found out that he was going to die, became the best day of his life. Now, what happened to Jack? Did anything externally happen different to Jack? No. He didn't win the lottery. He didn't get an inheritance. You know, he didn't get promoted. He didn't become famous. He didn't go out and buy a new car. He didn't go get a new house. He just got to live another day the same way he always lived. He ate the same breakfast. He kissed the same wife goodbye. He drove the same old car to the same old job. Came back home to the same old house. Lived at the same old dining room table. But I tell you what. Now he knew something was totally different. The ordinary wasn't any ordinary thing anymore. The usual wasn't usual anymore. My friend, you might be going through life thinking, God doesn't care about me. God doesn't care about me. I'm stuck in the same old job, driving the same old car, kissing the same old spouse. Let me tell you something. There's somebody on this planet who would love to change places with you. And they would love to drive your old car and live in your old house. And yes, even kiss your same old spouse. They would love that. That would be their great day. Even if you're not married, even if you don't have a job, even if you don't have a car, this applies to you. There are people who, if they were in your place, would consider it their best day to be in your place. 
but we don't see it. The birds of the air see it. The flowers of the field see it, but we don't. Jesus says there's this wonderful God watching over you in this world because today is the day the Lord has made. And you know, if we could really get it in our heart, what Jesus is actually saying, how if we could fix our minds on God in the correct way, we could actually live our life in a way where we wouldn't have to worry because we have this, this eternity created in our heart. We have nothing to worry about because we live in the palm of God. We live in the hands of God. You know, there's an old hymn of the faith that, that I love to sing. I, I sing it to people in the hospital all the time. You know, it goes like this. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Sparrows, by the way, five for two pennies. How much more are you worth? In the Bible, there are a surprising number of promises that claim the same thing. Jesus' words, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, we will not fear. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? In other words, ultimately and eternally, God is with you. God holds you. God takes care of you, and that means all is well. Your need for a good future is placed within you because he has placed eternity in your heart like no other being on this planet. He has placed eternity in your heart because he loves you that much to lead you to Jesus who holds the future in the palm of his hands. So Jesus says, consider this, don't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. This is what Jesus says, and this is what he claims. So listen, things are not just going to turn out well. They are going to indescribably turn out well. Things are not just going to be better. They are going to be increasingly and infinitely better than you think. Pain, suffering, injustice, death itself, they will not only be redeemed, these things will be gloriously redeemed. Every single one of them without exception. Now, if you're ready to give life beyond worry a try, you might do this. You might accept this invitation that Jesus is giving you now, and you'd be surprised. The invitation isn't, don't worry. It's not don't worry. See, you can't try harder not to worry. It doesn't work like that. We all know this. You know what? I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to worry. It doesn't work that way. And that kills people when you tell them, hey, just stop worrying. Jesus doesn't actually say this. Let me let you in on a little secret. Worry isn't a sin. 
People may choose to disobey God with greed and lust and pride and deceit, but nobody says, God, I am going to willfully betray you so that my life will be filled with this chronic anxiety and worry and misery. So if you struggle with worry, my friend, don't let guilt be thrown in with that. It's not your bag of rocks. What Jesus says is he gives an invitation in verse 33. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? Make seeking the kingdom of God your top priority above everything else. Get in on what God is doing. Make it your life mission to figure out what God's mission is what God treasures, what God loves. Make it your mission. Study God, love God, follow him, serve him. Be immersed in his teaching. Think about God, be generous like God, be surrendered to his will. Just be preoccupied with God. Find him in each moment. Find him in this moment. See him in each person's face. Hear his voice when people talk to you. You know, watch him at work with the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. Rearrange your life living around this amazing opportunity to follow Jesus with utter abandonment. Jesus says to do this one day at a time. Just one day at a time. He says, give us today our daily bread. In other words, live at the center of the cross. Be that red X. Just live in the center of your cross-formed life. That's your calling. Don't live in yesterday. Don't live in the future. Live in the here and now. It's when we look in the future that we get overwhelmed. I thought this was fascinating. I looked this up. The U.S. Department of Agriculture said that the average American eats 2,000 pounds of food every year. Two, one ton of food every year, each one of you and me. What if we were to actually have to sit in a room? What if you were to sit in a room with all the food that you were going to eat for the rest of your life? Now, let's say the average, the average age of an American, let's just, you know, 75, 75 years. That's 150,000 pounds of food, 75 tons of food. What if you were in the same room, 75 tons of food, you're sitting there, you'd be overwhelmed. And they said, hey, you're going to eat all of this. Get started. You'd be like, what? I, I, how, do, how do I even, how do we do this? It's incredible. But yet we all do it. We do it one day at a time. One day at a time. How will you face all the heartache and all the heartbreak of your life? How will you deal with all the problems of your life? How will you deal with all the disappointment? How do you deal with all the loss? How do you deal with all the grief? One day at a time. See, we think the answer to anxiety is, oh, well... We'll just need to pray for less anxiety. And that's how we can get around it. No. A lot of people have the misconception that, oh, you know what? If I follow Christ and I become a Christian and I make him the Lord and Savior of my life, it's his job to make my life easy. I'm not going to have any heartache. I'm not going to have any pain. At least I won't have as much as I did before. But that's not what Jesus says either. Holy cow, look at Jesus' life. He doesn't say, don't worry about tomorrow because if you have enough faith, everything's going to be good tomorrow. He doesn't say that. What he says is, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. <laughs> Each day has enough trouble of its own. I have this app on my phone. It's really cool. You might have it too where it kind of tells you what the weather's going to be, and it gives you a forecast. Let me tell you Jesus' forecast for my life. Today, trouble. Tomorrow, 
trouble. <laughs> That's his prediction for my life. Now, what do we do with all the terrible things from our past? We all have these pasts, you know. What do we do with all that stuff? We learn. Absolutely, we learn from it. Let me tell you what you don't do. You don't dwell on it. You don't minimize it, but you don't dwell on it. You don't deny it. You don't over-spiritualize it. You don't blame it. Somebody else. You recognize it. You grieve from it. And you learn from it. The strange thing is, very often times, the most painful things from our past end up being the most beautiful times of growth. Because it's in those really painful times that we actually start to connect with people. And we start to develop these relationships with people. And we create, because we're created in this, in this place in our lives where we have to be in community. That's why it's so important to attend church. It's not because we want to count numbers. It's because this is a place where we can live life together. And it becomes one of the most beautiful things of our lives. It was on a Friday that Jesus was hung on a cross. And if you can imagine being one of Jesus' disciples, you know, his very best friends, his inner circle, you know, they looked at that day and they saw Jesus and what he had to endure. And, and they just considered that a terrible, terrible day, maybe the worst day of their life, Friday. And then Saturday came. Friday, just awful, terrible, the worst day. And then Sunday came, Easter Sunday. Jesus defeated death. He overcame Satan and he resurrected from the dead, saving all of mankind. And it became the best day ever. And those disciples who saw and hated what happened on Friday, it kind of changed everything what happened on Friday to the point where it wasn't terrible Friday. It wasn't God awful Friday. It ended up being good Friday, all because of what happened on Sunday, the best day of their life. On Sunday, history got divided up into two sections, B.C. and A.D. You know, it all got divided up by this one man who changed the history of the world. What happened before Christ, what happened after him. Can I share with you a little bit? I'm going to open up with you a little bit from, from my past. I want to give you a sentence that has helped me with problems for quite a long time. Thirteen years ago, I faced a time of really deep worry and sadness caused by my own failure. And it was a situation of, I kid you not, my friends, it was gut level raw pain that involved my family and my close friends. It involved many life ministry decisions. It involved my ministry calling in ways that I could never see being redeemed again, ever. I remember thinking, you know what? If my life were to end today, man, if I didn't have to feel this pain anymore, I'd be kind of relieved. I'd be kind of okay with that. I wouldn't mind it at all. I was in trouble. I went and started seeing a, a professional counselor. You know, I even took some antidepressants to be able to, to keep functioning. And then I decided that I would reach out to one of my spiritual mentors who actually lived halfway around the world at that time. And I gave him a call. I laid out the whole situation. I waited on the phone for the words of what he was going to say to me. And there was this long pause, probably 10 seconds. And I tell you what, that was the longest 10 seconds. So I wasn't sure what he was going to say. He says, this will be a test of your confidence in God. Adam, this will be a test of your confidence in God. 
And he was exactly right. I can't tell you how many times that sentence came to my mind in the next few months after that. I mean, literally thousands of times, day in, night in, night out, just this will test your confidence in God. The serenity prayer says it so well. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. And every time, every time I tried to imagine what my future would look like and project my life in the future, every time it went to anxiety, which led to worry. So I had to learn just this day, just this day, just strength for this day, just bread for today. God, help me to just live in the cross-shaped life that you have got me to live right now. Now, much of my journey couldn't have been lived without people in it. It couldn't have been lived without other people that loved on me and encouraged me to share with me. When it comes to anxiety, never try to do worry alone. Never try to do anxiety alone. This is why it's so important to be in a community of believers. It's so important to be in a church setting like this. Where everybody is welcome, nobody is perfect, where anything is possible. We're wired to receive life from other people in our anxiety, in our pain, and in our fear. I'm going to give you another Gunther story. Gunther, uh, well, I've never really been a dog lover until Gunther. Let me just say that. Gunther is intentionally relational. He just is. That is at his core. He just loves to be with people. He thinks he's a lap dog. He's 90 pounds. He doesn't fit on anybody's lap anymore. Another thing about Gunther, he sheds about five pounds of, of hair every few minutes. <laughs> I love him to death, but holy cow. So we have this couch. You know, if you haven't been to my house, you need to come to my house. You got to come. We've got this brown couch. It shows every piece of dog hair on it at all times. And Gunther knows he's not allowed to be on the couch unless we're on the couch. He waits diligently for us to sit on that couch. And then he runs over. And he's so big, he doesn't really jump on the couch anymore. He gets his front paws up on the couch, up on your lap. Because he wants to be right here with you. He wants to be face to face, eye to eye with you. That's what he wants. He just wants to be near to you. When you worry, when you're filled with anxiety, when you're filled with, with this stuff that's tearing your heart inside out, do what Gunther does, run for the couch. Get face to face with somebody you love. Get eye to eye with somebody who truly cares for you. Don't do worry and anxiety alone. It's why I, I encourage everybody to be a part of a life group. A life group could change your life. It's not just something else to go to. It's, it's a way for you to be able to experience life together because we go through, can I say this? Crappy stuff. We go through a lot of bad stuff in our lives. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. There's a father who feeds the birds and dresses flowers. Your job is to live in the center of your cross-shaped life. Live in the center of that life, living in gratitude, anticipating in hope, dwelling in peace, engaging in love, living life together, being face to face with people who love you never being alone, living in the confidence that God holds you in the palm of his hands. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. God, 
give me today my daily bread. Amen. Let's pray.